Hey, how's it going? Today I'm finally giving in to the peer pressure and we're doing Scyther. This is perhaps the most requested run I've ever had and it goes all the way back to my very first solo run when one of my real life friends said I should do it. And I'm gonna be upfront with you guys and say that you should not expect greatness from Scyther. Since just like with Eevee, I'm gonna have to do Pokemon Tower with Bide, but I'll do my best to get a competitive run out of it if possible. I'll be doing this run on yellow version for a couple of reasons. The first being that I just don't play yellow enough enough and I love the sprout work and the second being is that you actually get wing attack in yellow even though it is at a very late level 50 but you get it I guess. But before we begin I'd like to say that I do solo run content often so if that is of interest to you consider subscribing to the channel to be kept up to date. Likes and comments also help out the algorithm and you guys have been killing it so if you're someone who just normally never interacts or comments just do me a favor and scroll down and type in bide time below so maybe we can get this video recommended to more people that enjoy this type of content. I don't have much to say, so with that said, sit back, relax, grab yourself a soda pop, and let's see how this buggy boy can do in the spotlight. Like always, I use an editor to make sure our Scyther has the best DVs to give us the best shot on the long road ahead of us. The name for this run will be Sickle for two reasons. The first is that Sickle is basically a tiny little Scythe, and the second is that I feel like I'm going to be sick of Scyther by the end of this run. As far as the rival fight goes, it's not much of an issue. Quick attack isn't great, but with really good attack and speed, I can make it through easy enough. As we progress through the opening battles, the plan for the evolution on the rival's team is Jolteon. Flareon is a viable option as well. We're weak to both of them, but I want to win both of these early rival fights for the very rough early game. Thankfully, Pokemon Yellow's early game is much easier than it is in Red and Blue, and we have extra trainers that aren't too bad to get past and ease the need for a lot of extra grinding. At level 9, I'm able to backtrack and pick up the optional rival fight, and before we go any further, can we just talk about Scyther's back sprite? To me, it kind of looks like a derpy dinosaur holding a banana. The straight line on its face looks like a mouth to me when it's not supposed to be and once you see it you can't really unsee it. It's really goofy and I just get to look at it for hours. By the time I pick up all the extra trainers and I finally finish up the Light Years Junior Trainer before Brock, I hit level 12 and obviously I'm gonna go ahead and give Brock a shot and you're gonna see how that goes. Despite being lower level and only having a 40 base power normal move that's resisted and not being the bulkiest Pokemon, I'm actually able to defeat the Geodude and get the Onyx to about 65% health. It's not a bad try, but I'm going to continue to talk over the footage. Now one thing, if you guys went and did your research, one thing you would need to understand is that out of all of YouTube, there exist only three runs of Scyther in Generation 1. There's two in Red and Blue, and they are smaller channels similar to mine, and then Scott's Thoughts has an early run against uh, Pinsir. The one common thing in each of these runs is that they all grind to 17, so that's kind of what I assumed I would have to do. So at this point, I begin grinding off camera because no one wants to watch you do five levels worth of metapod grinding but I'm still stubborn so I still attempt tries uh, here and there as I level up and to my surprise it's actually really consistent and pretty easy at level 15 before you even get to Leer at level 17. I get why the red and blue version would take to level 17 since both of Brock's Pokemon are two levels higher but I can only deduce that maybe Scott just assumed that you had to get there but like I said it was one of his early runs so let's not really dwell on that. As for the battle there's absolutely zero strategy strategy, you only have quick attack and you just use it until the battle finishes. So I was really surprised. I finished this battle off camera. I didn't save it. I reset and then I started recording and I beat it a second time in a row after that. So it's not like it takes some crazy amount of luck here. Overall, we are at 48 minutes of end game time here. And that's not really too great to get past Brock, especially when you consider that Scyther is racing up against Titans like Mewtwo and Nidoking in these how fast runs. The important part is that we get by here and just like with the run, this will be a mandatory TM to have yet another painful Pokemon Tower segment way down the line. But let's not think about that just yet, let's just celebrate these small victories while we can. Now if you take a gander over at Scyther's moveset, you'll see that it's absolutely abysmal. At level 29, Slash is a really good move, but that's essentially the only thing you have to look forward to. Quick Attack isn't the worst in the world, and since Scyther does have that sweet 420 Blaze it stat total, things just aren't bad in these next few segments. I will 
will draw attention to the fact that I'm still picking up the TMs so that I can sell them. I'll go into that much later, but it's a tiny little detail to keep in mind as the run progresses. I do pick up some extra battles, but eventually I do make my way to Cerulean, and here I do something a little different. I actually give Misty an attempt first, and it's actually not that bad, but the same potential problems are here with Starmie's high special and high crit chance along with Bubble Beam. Of course, it's going to use Bubble Beam immediately on the first turn, and it takes me really low, but a combination of it using X Defend and a Harden and being able to survive a Water Gun means that I actually get past this one without having to reset once, and that's always good to see. So now let's take a look at rival number two, and it's another one-shot victory. I do take a Sand Attack from Sandshrew, but it's not bad. The strategy is the same as always since we only got Quick Attack. I do have Focus Energy down, and we all know it's a bug move. It's supposed to raise your crit chance, but it lowers it instead. I originally thought about trying to utilize it since critting is bad when you're going to be using Sword Stance in the late game. Crits ignore stat changes, and since Scyther has such high speed, there's always that 1 in 5 chance that Sword Stance buffs will just be for nothing, but that's just me babbling a little bit. The TLDR is that Focus Energy kind of sucks. Outside of that, you might wonder how battles like the Hiker with the Onyx goes with only Quick Attack, and the long and short of it is that Leer really carries it hard. Just like with the EV run with Tail Whip, you can see that you can actually do some really heavy damage even with a low damaging move like Quick Attack. It's not really that interesting, but I may as well cover my basis on this run. Looking ahead at the SSN, Scyther can't learn Body Slam because why would a Pokemon with high attack that learns almost exclusively normal moves be able to learn that? It doesn't make any sense. So good job, Game Freak. I do pick it up and I do pick up the other optional TMs and items and I do some extra battles along the way. This takes us to rival number three and I'm not quite at that magical level 29. So once again, it's just quick attack for our only damaging move. I am getting low on PP and I don't want to use the Poke Center, so I do have to utilize Leer a little bit to kind of stretch it out as much as I can. This just means that I'm going to get chipped and dipped as the fight goes on and it's not really too bad. Scyther does have better stats than most runs I'm used to anyway and we have a nice level advantage so let's just move on. I see the SSN off and after rival number three I got the optional rare candy and unfortunately I got burned from the gentleman's fire Pokemon and there's no burn heals or this early in the game. You might wonder why I just didn't reset and I really don't have a good answer for you. Why indeed. Luckily it's not all grim as we are really close to level 29, but that means I do have to do some extra trainer battles inside of the gym. These battles are awful and something I never really talk about in my runs and what some people might not know is that being burned is not just a status that does damage to you. It also halves your attack and that just goes without saying that it's awful. Thankfully I only have to do it for a couple of battles and then I eventually get slashed and the crits are just going to ignore the stat changes like I mentioned earlier, so let's take a look at the gym. Gym battle. Lieutenant Surge being the electric gym introduces us to one of Scyther's 32 different weaknesses. Thankfully in Pokemon Yellow he only has a single Pokemon and Surge has pretty awful AI. Slash does some really crazy damage in comparison to what we've gotten used to and that's a really good thing going forward. Slash makes the game significantly faster and easier but my friends what kind of video would this be if we skip past the self-destruct hiker and rock tunnel? There's really only two takeaways from this fight. The first is that Slash 100% crit rate does heavy damage even against opponents that resist it so it's not bad at all. And second we just get a tiny little nibble of how bad rock moves are going to hurt our little buggy boy with its times 4 rock weakness. It is a one shot victory but I think it was worth showing. So now we can skip ahead to Celadon. I get the Pokedoll for Mimic in the future and I do things like take the free counter TM and I get one of each beverage to get all the TMs from the little girl. Like I said earlier I'm selling everything to make all the money possible and it's gonna make sense later guys I promise I have a scheme in mind next up I go straight to Erica because this is one of the few spots left that I can go that I have a great matchup I double resist grass moves and since Erica's team is significantly worse in yellow version I can just easily cut through her team and get another badge next up is the rocket hideout and now outside of picking up items to sell it's a pretty straightforward run to the first Giovanni fight but first I would like to mention that Scyther learns double team naturally during the 
in this section. I've never explicitly stated this in any of my videos, but I consider double team to be one of the cheapest and unskilled strategies to actually use in solo runs. No knock on anyone that does use them, I just think that they don't provide the challenge that I'm looking for. With that said, I did think of the possibility of allowing it on Pokemon that learn them naturally, since it's almost part of the flavor of that Pokemon if that makes sense. I end up learning it, but spoiler alert, I never actually use it on the run, but I do think a little insight of why I've never used double team or minimized on any of my runs might be useful information to a few people at least. And in my opinion, now is the time that Pokemon Yellow gets a difficulty bump, and with improved movesets, we get to see once again how bad some rocks are going to hurt Scyther. Look at the damage from this Onyx, it's massive. Slash does well enough here, and eventually I do get through, but Jesus Christ, that really hurt. After that, the Rhyhorn is very inept offensively, and it just can't do enough damage to threaten a reset, and luckily I've got enough damage to one-shot the Persian, so all in all, it wasn't that bad, but we always have that times four rock weakness just looming over our heads. Now there's only one place left to go, and just like the Eevee run, I have no way to hurt Ghastly. It took me countless times to get bod, and the perfect set of moves on both the Ghastlies to go right on that run, so I'm hoping that's going to be faster here. But first we have the rival number 4-5, and just like Red and Blue, it's very easy here. If I had to summarize this fight, I would say that it's the Slash show. It one-shots everything on his team, and there's no issues. I do get the opportunity to learn Swords Dance, and I decline since we've already talked about how it's pretty useless with Slash, and we can get the TM later, but let's just dive into the worst part of the run. What surprises me the most about other Scyther videos is just how quickly they skim over this part. I get that you want to save time, and that the longer the video, the less retention time you'll have, but I honestly think it's just really important that you guys know how awful this part really is. If you guys don't know, you haven't watched my Eevee video or similar videos, just know that Scyther can't hit Ghastly on its own. You have to use the BOD TM, hope that Ghastly doesn't confuse you, and uses a couple of damaging moves, and then you need it to act right for two or three turns, and then you can finally knock one of them out. What makes this just the worst is that the first channeler has two Ghastlies, so not only do you have to get a little lucky just to get one down, you have to get lucky a second time in a roll. With a high attack stat, hurting yourself in confusion and taking a nightshade will almost get you low enough to where you couldn't win the fight even if you somehow got perfect luck from that point, and it's a very small chance that that would ever even happen anyway. In fact, I'm going to say that it felt like there was about a 99% probability on this run that I would hurt myself from confusion, so much so that I started kind of wanting to look into if there was a bug to where if you were actively using Bide, you had an increased chance to hurt yourself. It was that much. It was pretty bad. So that's a little bit too much tin full hat theory for me personally, but I say all of this to you guys just so you get a little taste of why this segment is so awful and why there's probably only a few generation one Scyther runs out there because it's just bad. Eventually, I do get the required luck and I do make it past this nightmare and honestly, it's not as close to as bad as when I did it with Eevee, so let's just quickly move on from hell. I finish up the tower, grab the Pokey Flute, and now it's time to see how quick we can start to dash towards the end of the game. I make my way down to Fuchsia, and it's important to note the difficulty spike Yellow has here, opposed to the easier early game, when compared to Pokemon uh, Red and Blue. Koga and Sabrina have different teams, and a pretty massive maximum level jump from level 43 in Red and Blue all the way up to level 50 in Yellow. I'm not a professional game designer, but if I had to take a guess, I would say that this change is made to specifically push you towards finishing off the Team Rocket story arc. About halfway through the game, I do battle the trainers inside of Koga's gym because they didn't get the same treatment as Koga and they are still actually lower level and they provide some pretty easy and fast experience. I wrap up all the battles and from there I go ahead and I dip into the safari zone. There's lots of TMs for me to sell as well as the last HMs of the game and after that I head up to Sylph Co. The most important thing to pick up in here is Sword Stance but I do pick up some other bits and pieces as well. I do battle some extra trainers in preparation for the rest of the game and it does take a little time but it's nothing difficult. At the end of that I head to rival number 5. I'm level 43 and let's just take a look. He leads with Sand Slash. It knows Poison Sting, and good AI means that he's just going to spam that, but it's such a bad move that even being weak to it, it's actually kind of a blessing. Slash is good enough to get past this one with relative ease. Next up is Ninetales. Thankfully, it doesn't have Flamethrower, but I can't one-shot it, and I do take some decent chip damage from Ember before progressing on. Next up is Cloyster, and this is where it starts to get problematic. High defense means that this clam can tank three slashes, and it also introduces us to yet another one of Scyther's weaknesses with an 
Aurora Beam. Since I've already taken some damage, I just can't outpace it and I lose this attempt. I try a couple more times and more or less it's pretty much the exact same result and it's clear that I can't get past in my current state. I do have some options, but in the short term, I do decide that it would be the most efficient if I just go level up a little bit and we can see if that makes the fight any better. I crush some grunts, I get up to level 45 and let's see how that changes our luck. The Sand Slash was already pretty good, pretty consistent and there's not much to say about this one. The Nine Tails is where you start to see the first big improvement. I can now one shot it with a slash rather than it hanging on and getting off some damage. So that's really good. And now for the moment of truth, Cloyster comes in and it now looks like Slash is actually a two shot and that's pretty great news. It's still going to get off attack and it does a lot of damage, but now we are more healthy and we can get it down in just two slashes, which means we can see the rest of the fight. And one of the huge changes in yellow version is that the rival is still using a Kadabra and that's great because Slash can still obliterate it. Jolteon is last and although this thing is lightning fast, Scyther still outspeeds it and Slash is once again really carrying us really hard in the mid game for another one shot. Honestly this fight wasn't too bad. If it wasn't for the Cloister I think we could have saved a lot of time but progression is always nice and let's just look ahead. The scary part here is that I didn't save it. I'm always thinking about the grunt in red and blue. I didn't think about Jesse and James as soon as you hit that portal and if I would have lost this fight I would have been pissed but it wasn't a big deal. Next up is Giovanni number two and can we perhaps expect to see some more Scyther weaknesses creep up again? And the answer is no. This is perhaps one of the easiest fights in the entire game. He feels underpowered and outside of the Rhyhorn resisting slash everything else gets destroyed. I don't take a single point of damage and we can just move on to bigger and better things real quickly. And that's going to be Sabrina. Let's take a quick look. And I say quick look because honestly I think her team is just really bad in the yellow version. Abra doesn't even know any moves and everything is just really frail. We already knew that. There's not much analysis for this one and this is one of those kind of blink and you miss it type of fights but it's always good to have some of those in the run at least. Now I can finally backtrack towards Koga and let me just say that I hate this yellow version team. It's very annoying. It's like the Yu-Gi-Oh anime where he uses all the little Karibos and they start stacking up. The Venonats are the Karibos. They all have toxic and they all have annoying status moves and they're just fodder. The idea is that you get poisoned with toxic. They slow you down and annoy you and then by the time you make it to that final Venomoth it just stalls you until you lose. What ends up happening here is Slash is just the dominant move still at this stage in the game. And although I do fail to knock out the level 48 Venonat and it does get a toxic on me, I'm still able to clean up the fight and still be relatively healthy. Again, I like Koga has this new identity in yellow version, but it's more annoying than anything else. I get what they're going for. From there, I pick up Mimic because I forgot to earlier. And my friends, it's probably no secret that Scyther is not going to be a top tier run, but I have been saving that money. I've mentioned it. I pick up the coin case and you guys know where this is headed. I haven't been able to use generation one hyper beam in an actual playthrough and since Scyther's main damaging moves to take advantage of sword stance come down to wing attack at level 50 using swift or using double edge I decided that this is the run where we're getting hyper beam. I actually practiced manipulating the slots to see how fast it would be but I did find in testing that it's just easier to naturally accrue the 110,000 pokey dollars that you need and once you're this late in the game you can pretty easily do that. The real slog here is that in generation one you can only buy 50 coins at a time and you need 5,500 in total. In later games you can buy 500 at a time but I seriously I just have to sit here for several minutes mashing A but eventually I get the required coins and I trade them in and now it's time to beam some unexpected trainers. Now it's time for a nice brisk swim down to Cinnabar and I picked this part of the game for hyper beam because honestly Slash is just really good and it's really quick but now things are really starting to ramp up so I need that extra burst to keep things smooth. I don't battle any extra trainers here and after a Scyther edition of Tombstoner brother it's time to face another one of our weaknesses. Blaine has a really high level team in yellow and fire isn't what we want to see. I immediately full send a hyper beam on the nine tails without setting up and unfortunately it fails to knock it out. That means I do have to recharge but Blaine's AI is random and I don't take any fire damage it uses two quick attacks and then I finish it off eventually. Rapidash is next and since I failed to knock out the nine tails I know I need to set up here. I take a growl and multiple takedowns I'm getting extremely low but eventually I do set up sword stance completely. I'm worried about the growl but I still one shot it with beam and that's a big testament to the absolute power we now have at our disposal. Arcanine is last and since we're already boosted who cares about the growl I full send another hyper beam and even though it has a six level advantage
advantage over us and it's a thick boy we can one shot it and this was a very welcome one shot victory and a very good test run with hyper beam now there's only one gym left i do hit level 50 and we get our yellow exclusive move and wing attack and then i learn mimic because it's going to be very key for this fight and let's see how it goes the doug trio is first and taking earthquake with mimic is key here i take a single sand attack and apparently that lowers hyper beams 90 percent accuracy down to zero percent i miss three turns in a row then i get sand attacked again and then i decide fuck it i'm just gonna set up swords dance and then i miss over and over and eventually i'm able to get through but this was an extremely long and annoying battle i should have just reset but i press on persian is next and although i do take some damage because i miss several moves it's not as bad as the doug trio and it too predictably goes down in one hit nino queen is next i actually don't miss here and the earthquake as you might have guessed is also enough to one shot it and things aren't looking too bad we might make it but things go extremely downhill when i realize that nidal king has thunder in yellow version and i miss multiple earthquakes one thunder is not enough to one shot me i do have a second chance at getting through this part but a second thunder after i miss again seals my fate and the improved movesets in the late game are the real area that yellow greatly improves the difficulty over red and blue and this is a great example jumping into the next attempt the start is similar i do set up some sword stance take earthquake and I get through with only one sand attack this time. Now let's jump back to where I failed last time on the Nidal King and this time I don't miss and I take it out and who knew that if you actually hit your moves it makes a really huge difference in the fight. Last up is Rhydon and I immediately hit a huge earthquake but it's so bulky and it survives. And ladies and gentlemen this is what it looks like when you get hit by a stabbed rock slide. It utterly destroys us and that's this attempt over with. Now that we know how the first part plays out let's just look at the Rhydon in the next attempts. I do heavy damage with an earthquake once again and I get the luck required when Giovanni uses a guard spec and this battle is all but over, right? Well guys, sometimes I'm not the smartest person in the world and I see an opportunity. I go for a very disrespectful hyper beam and of course it's gonna miss and the next turn I meet my end with a rock slide. And you guys can't blame me for going for that hyper beam though, right? Say what you will about me, but saying that I'm not gonna seize the opportunity to go for that style point hyper beam knock out and the ride on isn't one of them don't judge me stop judging me right now on the very next attempt i go for earthquake and this time it just one shots it magically despite nothing changing and that's it that's the fight somehow cool at the end of the day it honestly wasn't too bad all i have to say is thank god for mimic and that his other pokemon didn't have rock moves but let's keep it going ahead boys rival number six is immediately up next and it's very similar to the fifth rival fight sand slash is once again the lead and it's only going to go for poison stings this allows me to boost my attack via sword stance and now i can just start letting that beam loose execute is up next and since we have wing attack our only stabbed move we can just easily one shot it and move on because execute is not good enough for a hyper beam nine tails is next and guys i'm not trying to be a broken record here but just brace yourself for things getting getting beamed left and right out of orbit. It's gonna happen a lot during these final battles. Now it's time for Cloyster. And honestly, right here, I was scared to go for Hyper Beam and I don't risk it. Wing Attack does crit and that means I do significantly less damage than I should. I take a super effective Aurora Beam back and I'm getting a little bit low, but you can see how much more damage a non-crit Wing Attack does. It completely obliterates it even though it has like 180,000 defense. Looking back on the footage, I do think a Hyper Beam would have one shot it. Next up the rival still doesn't have an alakazam and that's great for us a wing attack is more than enough but i'm in a disrespectful mood and i give it a hyper beam anyway just for all the trouble we've had in the past with all the other runs last but not least is jolteon and i don't even need to say what's going to happen here everyone loves generation one hyper beam and this video is here to finally deliver on that fantasy and honestly you can see what peak scyther looks like during this fight swords dance on a pokemon that already has massive attack combined with a broken 150 base power move can really carry you very hard in bad matchups. But guys, we have the big boys left before this run is over. And they're going to be a ton of matchups that Scyther is weak to. And I do not expect to this be a one shot hyper beams flying out everywhere. Me celebrating, blowing my kazoos or whatever people celebrate with these days. But we do have wing attack that gives us some ghost coverage, some Bruno coverage, if anybody's ever needed Bruno coverage. But let's just kind of get to 
to it. Before I go in, I do use all but a few of our rare candies so I can reset our experience later and not level up mid fight in the last few battles. And we begin our attempt against the Ice Goddess Lorelei at level 60. First up is Dugong and I'm just filling out the fight. I see how much a wing attack does and it's not great. I take some heavy super effective damage back. From there, I can toss out a beam and move on at about half health. Cloyster is next. I throw out a very pathetic wing attack and for my trouble, I get a beam back but it's of the ice variety and it knocks me out. Adjustments will need to be made. On the next attempt, I make absolutely no adjustments. I do decide turn one hyper beam might do the trick but Dugong is tanky, it survives and since I have to recharge, I take extra damage all the way down into the red health but I do get to move on. But from there, I really don't stand a chance. I should have just done a hyper beam just so I can have an idea of how much damage it does but I don't and I die and this one's looking rough. The next attempt, I do a turn one swords dance. This boosts our damage and gives us a slight special increase to tank more effectively. I take slightly less damage and a hyper beam can now one shot after the swords dance. On Cloyster, I once again go for a wing attack but I crit and it doesn't do a lot of damage. I take an ice beam all the way down to 18 health but hyper beam does take it out and we can finally see that third Pokemon. And this isn't your mom and dad's red and blue slow bro. This one has psychic and after I make a futile attempt to set up it does take me out immediately after. The next attempt I do a swords dance and I get some luck when the dugong goes for a bubble beam. It does lower my speed but it does pretty low damage and that's great. I can take it out with a single beam from there. On the cloister I wisen up and I go straight hyper beam. I crit and that's bad because it does less damage than it would with a swords dance. It does trigger a potion but since I have to recharge I take an ice beam but I am able to move on in the fight the next turn. On the slow bro you're gonna notice that I'm really indecisive here. The original idea is to chip it with a wing attack and then go for a hyper beam but when it starts going for withdrawal I make the call to finish setting up. Eventually I take a surf from my trouble and I'm deep in the red but I am able to finish it off and I'm fully boosted moving ahead. Jinx is next. Its defense isn't great and I'm boosted out of my mind. I go with the tried and true strategy of hyper beam and that progresses us to the end of the fight. Lapras is a very nice and tanky boy but not even this nice chubby boy can survive a triple swords boosted hyper beam and this is my first successful Lorelei attempt. Honestly it's not that great. It's really not the world's most consistent fight but at this point you guys kind of get the gist of what needs to happen here. So we are done with Lorelai for this video. Guys say goodbye to Lorelai. Next up is Bruno and even though he is improved in yellow don't get too excited. On the onyx you might be worried for me but be smarter than that please. I just mimic dig and I take it out very quickly. I take several screeches but let's see if that really matters. On the Hitmonchan I would really like to set up here but I'm hesitant. I just go for the wing attack and it does great damage but not enough to one shot. I was afraid if I hyper beamed it wouldn't knock it out and then maybe I would get hit with the highest damage counter in history. When it's the Hitmonlee's turn I do set up a single swords dance but when Bruno once again shows that he's a degenerate and he wants to start using double team I just go ahead and I wing attack and we move on. Now the second Onyx comes in and I have a tiny little baby boost so I just go straight for the dig. To show you guys how pathetic Bruno is he actually goes for an earthquake even though flying types are immune to it and for that he pays with Onyx's life. Machamp is the final Pokemon and just to play it safe I go for dig for the invulnerable turn I'm not sure if it really mattered since submission is double resisted but it's a one shot and that's Bruno and when I say he's bad I really do mean it all the way from the bottom of my heart. Next up is Agatha, and this is the main reason I'm doing the run on yellow. Having to mimic Lick isn't the worst strategy. Maybe I should try it out, probably not, but I'd rather just have wing attack here. The first Gengar doesn't have hypnosis, so I'm honestly taking this fight a little light here. What ends up happening is I try to set up, and then I get confused raid, and I start doing some confusion damage to myself. The Licks start adding up, and I get paralyzed, which means it's a very slow battle. It takes me a while. I do get passed, but things are just kind of up heal from here. Go back is next and although I easily have the damage, being paralyzed means that I'm just going to continually take chip damage before I move on and that's exactly what's on display here. On the Haunter, it goes for a wasted Dream Eater and a wing attack alone is enough with the boost to quickly move on. From there, Arbok looks like it's just going to try to wrap me down forever but Agatha does make a very quick and aggressive swap into the final Gengar and I take a Psychic and that's the attempt. On the next one, I'm just going to try straight wing attacks and it's just not 
quite strong enough. What ends up happening is although Lick is extremely weak, it's just going to be able to get off too many of them and it's obviously going to eventually paralyze me and that's not my favorite position to be in. On the go back, I have no choice but to fully set up and just hope I can brute force my way through this fight. Things are going okay until the Golbat just crits on a wing attack for massive damage and I'm able to fully set up and take it out and I'm going to need some luck here. The Hunter does go for a lick which is low damage, that's good. I lose my turn due to being fully paralyzed. It goes for another lick and then eventually I get off a boosted wing attack and that takes us on in our slow and steady journey. On the Arbok, I do get a stroke of luck here, it misses Rap. I get off the hyper beam and even if I fail this attempt, a 100 to 0 hyper beam always makes me feel good on the inside. On the last Gengar, it goes for Psychic, but our buggy boy is actually able to barely tank it. I get my turn off and a wing attack with the boost is enough to move us on towards Lance. Obviously this fight can go much better. The attempts where I don't get paralyzed earlier are very easy, but I just think that this one was the most interesting success. Jumping into Lance and on his Gyarados, I'm just scrolling through my my moves like a spaz because I don't know what I want to do. I end up using Swords Dance to get a tiny little boost of defense and obviously it's just going to immediately crit with a hyper beam of its own and I do barely hang on. I'm able to take it out with a beam on my turn which is kind of stupid because I could have used a second Swords Dance here but let's not talk about that yet. The first Dragonair comes in, hyper beam, next Pokemon please. The second Dragonair comes in, another hyper beam, moving on. Aerodactyl is next, I do outspeed. I don't have a great answer Answer, but Hyper Beam is the answer to all life's problems. It just barely misses knocking it out, and although it triggers a retroactive potion, I still get taken out with a wing attack on the next turn. On attempt two, I learn from my mistakes. A turn one Hyper Beam from Gary doesn't crit, and we are much healthier. I recognize that it needs to recharge, so I get that second Swords Dance off before taking it out, and we know how the Dragonairs are gonna go. I already had the power with one Swords Dance, so logically it should be an easy one shot for both of them. The key thing here was that the second Swords Dance should be that little extra tiny little boost that I need after them. So when the Aerodactyl comes in, my hypothesis was correct and I'm able to take it out and we can finally see that Dragonite. I'm unsure what to do here, so I go for a third Swords Dance since I'm not confident in my damage and much to my stupid ass's surprise, it has Fire Blast. Thankfully the special boosts are enough to barely survive and I do get burned. Even with the half attack and high Hyper Beam can one-shot it, and that makes me pretty much think that the third Swords Dance wasn't needed. I do get the win, and we can finally see the champion. At this point, we know the drill. Sand Slash on the lead, Poison Sting, Set Up, Hyper Beam. It's all very elementary Scyther strategies that we've all come to love through our journey. Alakazam is next, and I mimic Psychic here. I don't know why I did it. Even watching back the footage, I can only guess that it was for the Cloister, but either way, Hyper Beam, next Pokemon. Executor is honestly just nothing. Wing attacks and some annoyances are the best commentary I can give you before moving on. The next part honestly made me kind of mad. It's kind of hard to watch. I don't even use the psychic. I go for hyper beam, I miss, and then I get taken out on the next turn. Like what was my goal during this attempt? Maybe I misclick psychic rather than recover and that's what I wanted, but we'll never know because the time I played this run from the time that I edited it was a little bit apart. Next attempt, sand slash, swords dance, poison stings, hyper beam, moving on. On the Alakazam, I don't even use Mimic. I just go straight for the wing attack. Take it out. Fast and easy. We're skipping over the Executor. Onto the Cloister. I miss my Hyper Beam. And thankfully, you only recharge if you hit. I do take heavy, super effective damage back. But I'm able to one-shot it with a Hyper Beam. And that makes me pretty confident for the rest of the fight. Nine Tails is next. And at this point, this is just a montage of Hyper Beam one-shots. And it goes down. And finally, you already know what fate awaits this poor Jolteon. It's going to forever be known as the final Pokemon in a Scyther solo run and we send off one more beam for the road and we put an end to this run and Scyther has done it. And I'm not really sure what you guys would want me to say other than I told you so. You guys have been asking for this run and I told you that it was just a slightly better Eevee that has to go up against Mewtwo but let's take a look and see how the numbers stack up to that opinion. Scyther finishes the game with
with a level of 65 and an end game time of 4 hours and 51 minutes. Now I wouldn't say that that's a terrible time. It's a couple of minutes ahead of Pikachu and Charmander and it would be a pretty respectable time if Scizor existed in Generation 1 and this was the pre-evolved tier list. But as it stands now, it's on the full tier list and it's nearly an hour behind Parasect. But I think we can all agree that none of us really expected Scyther to do great and compete with the top dogs anyway. At the end of the day, if a bad full tier list run is sub 5 hours, I really don't mind. Honestly, it's not really Scyther's fault that the run wasn't great. It just has an abysmal moveset. A lot of the problems could have been avoided if it just learned Wing Attack in its 20s rather than level 50. Zubat could learn Wing Attack at level 28 for fuck's sake. What's up with that? This run did get me to kind of look at Pinsir, and I think a Pinsir run could be pretty amazing. Higher attack and lower speed synergize really great with Swords Dance, and it gets things like Body Slam and Seismic Toss that eliminate a lot of problems that Scyther had. The flying typing was also nothing but a hindrance on Scyther as well. It only provided more weaknesses and it never, it just never helped. But I digress, Scyther is in the books and I still have a few more requests to start working on. Let me know what you guys think down below and if you are still here at the end of the video, I really and truly do appreciate you and just thanks for taking the time out of your day to watch my content. But that's pretty much all I got for you guys today and I will catch you on the next video. Bye!